What is going on, guys? This is Skyhound, also known as Geek Archivist Xavier Pierce. And welcome to episode two of the Geek Archivist podcast, specifically Otaku Center. So I was planning on covering this for at least a few weeks, but again, I was just trying to get my notes together and all of this. But as you can see, I am covering a particular Yuri anime, which in my opinion and observation, I think is underrated. And if you really are going to try and argue about, you know, how certain um, characters are actually underrepresented, well, I'm going to have to debunk that and trigger some idiots, fifis, to get to this point. But as you can see, I am deciding to cover this particular anime, and I need to address the usual dumb criticisms on a superficial standpoint. They complain a bit about the mechs. They complain a bit about the supposed story. Well, to be frank, using mechs and female characters, I'll be really honest here. It's nothing new. Second, if you really want to go on about girls and mechs, there are some that already have been covered. Some people have cited Code Geass. Myself, I'm going to cite Clamp and Magic Knight Ray Earth. That, ladies and gentlemen, was back in the 90s. If you really want to talk about mechs and, you know, girls, you know, inside mechs. Furthermore, regarding that, there is a separate original animated video called Ray Earth, roughly of the same title, has the same titular characters, also has mechs to a degree in that one as well. I would suggest trying to take a look into that. But anyway, before I forget, if you guys do like you know, what you see in here, do hit that like and subscribe button. I would really appreciate it. It not only helps the algorithm a little bit, but it also gives a little bit of a boost to my channel as well. But with that being said, let me go over this really quick as best as I can. Kanazuki no Miko, the rough translation. I will say this as always. This is just how it is despite my Japanese being limited, it roughly stands for Priestess of the Godless Month. However, they reframed it as Destiny of the Shrine Maiden. This anime was released back in 2004. I was still in high school at that time. And the only time I got into it was back when I was in a message board back in the day for, as I mentioned a while ago, Magic Knight Ray Earth. One of my friends actually used a particular um, signature, if you will, and it showed these two female characters. These two. And both of them were holding swords and it was as if they were in a fight against each other. So eventually I asked my best friend, what is it? And what is it supposedly about? He gives me the rundown in terms of what this is. So again, I'm going to be blunt here. Most people only look at it through a superficial lens. Emphasis on the word superficial. If that is too difficult for people to understand, good. Because I'm about to go in a direction that most likely 
don't consider. So some of you guys likely know that there is a spin-off, but they're not the same. What do I mean by that? Well, after this was finished, eventually they did a spin-off called Kyoshiro Totoa no Sora. While I have a little bit of an understanding of it, I haven't finished it, just to be clear. However, people do cite these two and the fact that the design of those characters resembles these two. There is a key moment regarding those two similar characters. And yet, despite having not finished watching it, there is a moment where the lookalike mentions to the other one in a previous life. There's your hint in a previous life. She recognized her and supposedly they were close. So that gives you an indication of the whole reincarnation, having a previous life, previous memories of a different time. That is your hint but enough of me stressing that part out just to make things clear for those who don't understand let's get to the meat and potatoes on this so historically speaking while this was back in the early 2000s this does reference let me be 120 percent clear here this does reference Japanese folklore. Folklore, which is simply saying stories that are made by the natives of said country in order to make sense of life. So, this one was based on a story regarding Amina Murakumo which happens to be the name of a sword used by a particular warrior by the name of Susano. Now, this does also mention about a hydra-like demon creature known as Yamata no Orochi. If you want another context of this particular tale, for those of you who are familiar with a game, a video game called Okami, you likely know about the white wolf that is referred to as Amaterasu, who happens to be a sun goddess. This in turn does reference a little bit of Japan, which of course is the reason why it is called Land of the Rising Sun. But before I go on any further about that, I do want to point out here, when I had gotten this, I actually received this back in 2007. In other words, I actually bought this by sheer luck because I was looking for it because I liked it so much after I finished watching it on the internet. I had bought it in 2007 when I first attended my very first anime convention called Anime Expo. At that time, it was hosted over in Long Beach. But I will eventually be covering my convention adventures at some point, Anime Expo being one of them. Now, Genon, which is no longer around, also did other anime titles, if you go ahead and look it up. One of them having to be Vandred. That was also roughly released within the same year. Now, 
again, going back to the historical story folklore of this anime, what the story of Susano, Ami no Murakumo, and Yamata no Orochi entails is that as the story goes, there is a town in Japan that was being, you know, threatened by Yamata no Orochi. And so in order to appease it, they had a young maiden to be sacrificed to the creature. Now, on a historical context, you could say this is almost similar to that of, I don't know if I would actually say the hero's journey, but there is some parallels to one could say um, European storylines. You know, the whole dragon taking the maiden and, you know, the dragon kind of like, you know, being a hoarder of gold and, you know, defending its, you know, stash, if you will. Then you have a character, you know, usually a guy going to try and slay said dragon in order to rescue the maiden. Well, while that part is true in that Japanese folklore sense, as you can see, I'm trying to make this parallel here. In this case for Kanazuki no Miko, what you have is two priestesses who are reincarnated in modern day times. And the thing is, we find out that, you know, the events of before is repeating itself again. Basically, those who are marked to serve Orochi and act as a vessel, if you will. I want to be clear here. Yamamata no Orochi, as a hydra, it has eight heads. The difference being is that we see seven of the eight. On top of that, one of the Orochi, Soma, he has a brother. And the anime does go into some background regarding, you know, some of these characters. One of them um, deals with cats. Another one is a failed artist. Another one is um, a manga artist. Then you also have one who is um, a bit of a, a bit of a jerk, like a street jerk if you will then you have one who is a former priestess or nun then of course you have the two brothers soma and his older brother ogami i forgot actually i forgot his name but soma has an older brother in this one so that's a total of seven what is not mentioned is the final one number eight that does get revealed a little later. The thing is that some of these episodes do give some context into some of the heads. And there's an interesting aspect where when Soma is actually fighting against, you know, the urges um, that comes from being an Orochi, of course, they have to destroy the Mikos, or the priestesses in this case, which is Chikane and Himeko. Now, the thing that's interesting is that when those two, when their paths cross, the thing is that um, some of the girls who are actually bullies, um, they're a little surprised when, um, when Himeko's friend actually um is telling her that you know they're late for school and all that as they're going along himiko gets um thrown off by three of the girls who are actually you know being bullies to her but 
when she gets picked up by um, Chikane, the girls are surprised. But at the same time, Kimiko's friend actually points out to her, you know, I'm a little surprised that, you know, she held you because as a result of that happening, most of the other girls are really jealous of Himiko, even her best friend to an extent. And her friend is pointing out that Chikane is so damn popular and, you know, beautiful and all that. She has gotten numerous um, letters from both men and women, young boys and girls. So to put into context, she is liked by a lot of admirers, but she only has eyes for Himiko. Now, some can argue maybe she knew her in another life. Well, for those who go in that direction, let me tell you right now, you guys are actually on the right track. Because as the story progresses, you know, they find out what's going on and realize since they're both priestesses, they have a certain duty to their country and the world to prevent, you know, um, Yamata no Orochi from causing another so-called apocalypse, if you will. And that's where Ami no Murakumo comes in. The only thing is that with each encounter, um, they struggle trying to awaken it. And before I go on any further, I will say that I am kind of spoiling this a little bit. So spoilers for those of you who have not watched it. On top of that, this originally had only two volumes. Two manga volumes because there's only 12 chapters. So do the math. 12 divided by 2. You get the picture. The slight difference being, since I did also read the manga online, because I had trouble trying to find it, you know, in bookstores, the manga kind of goes a little bit further for only two volumes, a little bit, they add some other context that the anime doesn't quite fully cover, but the anime does cover enough to an extent. But it is the ending that is different because the manga does mention two, let me say it again, two reincarnation outcomes. The anime only addresses one. Furthermore, when I was watching this back in the day, there used to be a, um, one could say, web website that actually did host some of this stuff called um, Nebs TV. Quick shout out to the former um, owner of the website. I did manage to find them once on Twitter, I think they're still around. But I did let the guy know that um, I did get some anime episodes from his site back in the day. Kanazuki no Miko turns out to be one of those anime that I got from that website. Now, here's something interesting before I go on to like the story of this short anime. 
according to the subs, the fan sub at least, if you guys watch the original opening, they do mention that um, there's a story regarding a pink seashell necklace. Interesting tidbit. My best friend actually had the special edition of, I'm pretty sure it was on the very last one because there was only, I think, um, give me a second. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Sorry, I was just trying to do the math in my head because looking back at it, this one only had four episodes and there was only three DVDs. So do the math, 12 divided by four. You get the idea. When my best friend actually got the final DVD, it was, from what I recall, a special edition. And with it came also the aforementioned pink shell necklace. Now, what I recall very faintly, unfortunately, I don't even know if it's still around, but what the fan sub did mention is the story on this, this necklace that you that is shown in the anime, and they also put it for this special edition. The story goes, if you find someone that wears the exact same seashell necklace, the story goes that is supposedly destined to be your significant other. In other words, your lover, boyfriend, girlfriend, etc. That is roughly what I recall what the fan sub mentioned regarding the story of that necklace in summary. Now, with that little tidbit out of the way, so there's a specific reason as to why the priestesses struggle in trying to revive Aminomura Kumo. And there's a point um, after when you get to roughly the halfway point, my best friend did tell me that there is a moment where it kind of goes a little dark and a bit graphic. Not exactly graphic to the extent of hentai, mind you, but, well, Chikane betrays Himeko's trust. How, you might ask? Well, I don't want to fully spoil it. But if you are able to get past that particular point in that story and then get to the end, let me remind you right now, you're going to need tissues, especially when you get to the final episode. I will not lie. The music is really good. Because when I was watching that final episode, oh my gosh, I was bawling my eyes out. It was so emotional that I was thinking in my brain, please don't let this actually happen because I was really rooting for those two. And the thing is that right before it gets to roughly the climax of you know this anime, you do find out the reasons why Chikani did what she did. And there's only a tiny spoiler that I will bring up. She actually um, dispatches some of the remaining Orochis. Yeah, she takes out the other heads, which means she decided to become the final head. Now, there is a bit of a tragedy regarding the story of the Mikos and the use of Amino Murakumo. In order to defeat Orochi, 
and then do the reincarnation process to have the world as it once was. This is where it gets tragic. And I'm spoiling it a little bit, but in order for the world to be reset, one priestess has to sacrifice the other by their own hand. And I'm like, damn, that really sucks. I mean, really, think about it. If in order to save the world and literally reset it, you have to kill someone that you really care about and the possibility of not knowing them in the next life, like, how can you respond to that? How can you even go through with it? I mean, really, that could really psychologically mess a person up. And you're like, is it really worth it? That is one question that I think some fans kind of like go over in their head as they're watching this. But really, if you think about it, it is a bit tragic to an extent. But now that you guys got the gist of it, I will now get to um, the two reincarnation endings that is mentioned in the manga. So towards the end, it's been a while since I've read it, but one of the endings has the two be reincarnated as sisters. The second one is the one that was used in the anime. They both get reincarnated, but they're total strangers. And one of the things that the anime does bring up is, you know, they eventually fall, you know, fall in love again, that they eventually recognize each other. But one can argue that the connection is a lot deeper than before. On top of that, if you recall, I mentioned about the story of that pink seashell necklace. So that does come into play, the significance of that. Also, quick shout out to the artist Kotoko, who actually did the music, the songs for this anime, which FYI, for those of you guys who've watched it, know this, the ending, Agony, and then the picture that I obviously showed at the start before I even started this episode, that one has been utilized to death. It is so flippin' recognizable that it has been used for not just gay and lesbian pairings, but also straight ones. But that thing is so flippin' iconic that, like I said, it's been used to death. I've seen probably, I don't know, maybe 8 to 10 videos, music videos, using that song and that you know, that background. Even one from my favorite Yuri pairing, Maho Shoujo Lyrika Nanoha, Nanoha and Fate. Those of you guys who know about particular magical girl genres likely know about that. So as you can tell from my, the way I express that, yeah, I flip and support it. But yeah, I did see that once. On YouTube. I don't think it's there anymore, but you get the point. Anyway, music wise, while I have not listened to the original soundtrack, Kotoko actually did all three songs for this anime. The first one, Resublimity, which is the opening. Then you have the insert song, um, Separation. That is actually the only song that plays in one episode. Specifically, episode number five. I will not go through it entirely, but I will point out when exactly it hits. So, Soma and his older brother, they have a bit of a rough um, sibling relationship. 
the thing is that the older brother did um i can't remember if he um murdered the foster father but they were abused and it got to the point where the older brother had to defend his younger brother from being physically abused justified but considering they're both orochi and you know soma is on the opposite end of the spectrum if you will the two have a bit of a fight and just as the cigarette drops you know they're both going at each other and chikane being the sun priestess senses something's going on and when she wakes up i mean not sorry not chikane i i misspoke it's been a while since i've watched it i meant himiko sorry himiko is the sun priestess she wakes up chikane notices and you know himiko is telling her something's going on i need to see soma can you please take me over there and you see the expression on chikane's face she's like you can tell that she likes her but at the same time considering that both that both of them are priestesses she's like okay something is probably definitely wrong and she wants to see what's going on because she also cares for him as a friend and wants to see if he's okay so she's like okay we'll go together and so by the time they arrive there, you know, Soma eventually gets the upper hand and he wins. But what is clear is that they know that, you know, the situation is slowly starting to get worse. And the fact that eventually, you know, things do take a turn, slide in there. That's when, you know, things start to go from really bad to I'm like, okay, I've been dealt this hand, but I have to do what I got to do. And what motivates Himiko at this point in time is she wants to understand why Chikane did what she did because she is in utter disbelief after what she experienced. And eventually, by the time you get to the final episode, like I said, you're going to need tissue boxes for this. Himiko does find out the truth. And it's the last two episodes, 11 and 12 where you really learn the tragedy of them being priestesses and what their fate is. So overall, I will say that it does take the whole Japanese folklore to, I don't know if I would say a modern audience take, although it kind of does because they're using mechs but this is more on a metaphorical level now the way it flows for 12 episodes from my observation i would say it's not very strong but it is good enough and entertaining enough that you get the general idea of what it entails what it's about and then you know go with it what you will overall i think it's still underrated but in terms of like really cementing the yuri genre aspect i would say that this is ground zero for sure However, there are those of you who will likely say, 
What about Sailor Moon? Huh? If you're referring to um, Haruka and Michiru, I get it. However, in terms of the alphabet people, historically speaking, Yaoi has a bit more um, historical longevity, let me put it that way. It has been around longer than Yuri. And on a historical aspect, I can actually confirm this to an extent, but my knowledge is limited. However, I'm just saying that the whole gay part has been around longer than the one regarding girls. That one comes later. That's all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not disregarding it. I'm just stating, historically speaking, one has been around longer than the other. That's all. So. Overall, I will say if I was going to be grading this again, I think it still hasn't changed. Story-wise, I would give this between a 7 and 8 out of 10. The music, definitely a 10 out of 10. Characters, somewhere between an 8 or 9 out of 10. That's roughly how I put it. The, excuse me. The overall grading on this one, it still hadn't changed when I originally thought um was going, excuse me, it didn't change when, when I was going over it. Overall, I'd still give it at least an 8 out of 10. It's good. I mean, it's great, but it's not awesome. The story, while simplistic, one can argue that there are some issues with it are there those that are able to um articulate and expand on it better than me definitely from an entertainment from an objective standpoint i would give it a 7 out of 10. subjectively 8 out of 10. so yeah, that is roughly my overall thoughts and general review of Kanazuki no Miko. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys are trying to go for the full 12 episode, three part DVD of this anime, I don't know exactly where to point you guys, considering this has been since 2004. I know they only re released it though some years later. I don't even know if it's still around. You'd be lucky enough you can even find it. But for the most part, it would likely be pre-owned. That's all I can say about this. Thankfully, I am still glad that I own at least the first volume. So, yeah, it's still good. Would I recommend it for those who want to get into, you know, something regarding, you know, Yuri characters and mechs? Well, if that strikes your fancy, give it a look. I will say this. Spin-off. Again, Kyoshiro Totoa no Sora. That one, while it does have some similar connotations to this, they are not the same. I will stress it again. They're not similar. I don't care about your feelings. You're really not paying attention if you can't understand that. They're not the same. Similar characters does not mean same in appearance. But you guys are going to likely cite, well, what about what you said earlier about, you know, what one of them said in a previous life? Yes, a previous life. That does not mean that they're referring to the same events. But overall, 
I definitely enjoyed this one. Is it still a tearjerker? Yeah. With that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this. This has been Skyhound, also known as Geek Archivist Xavier Pierce. FYI, I know that the 30th anniversary of the manga for Magic Knight Ray Earth is coming up, at least volume one. I will say that I already planned ahead. I did a recording for it. I did go over my um, convention adventures a little bit and how I met a few of the English voice actors who was in that anime. Three of them, to be in fact. Here's the kicker. Two of these voice actors played Ranger characters, Power Ranger villains, FYI. So I will eventually be uploading that. Then I will be going over the second volume soon enough. But yeah, so if you guys are into that, I would suggest looking into both the manga and anime. But this has been Skyhound, also known as Geek Archivist Xavier Pierce. Stay safe, stay sane, and as my friend Orange Hat would say, stay humble. Peace.